The scripture reading this morning, this morning will be from Amos chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Good morning. May God bless the reading of his word. It's good to see each of you here this morning. And for those who are joining us online, we are thankful that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. We have two meetings right after worship this morning. The kids and their parents who will be involved in the puppets with lads will be uh, up front right after worship. And then those who would like to be a part of the planning for our Vacation Bible School uh, this summer will be in the classroom down that hallway also right after worship. Now we're supposed to have a deacons meeting today at 2.30. Uh, it's also supposed to snow and I hope our deacons don't get snowed in because they don't need to be wandering around the building unsupervised. <laughs> so hopefully the weather will cooperate this afternoon. This last Monday, our nation celebrated Martin Luther King Jr. Day. This day has been a set aside by our country to honor what Martin Luther King did in contributing to the rights of black Americans in our country. I do not agree with everything that Martin Luther King believed politically or religiously, but I am thankful for what he contributed to a better view of equality among the races in our country. He made a famous speech called the I Have a Dream speech, August the 28th, 1963, at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. And in one part in that speech, he made the statement that you see on the screen. He said, we cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote. And a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. There are probably not too many Americans who recognize that last statement as being a quotation from the Bible. That last statement, justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream, comes from a minor prophet in the Old Testament by the name of Amos. Every year I pick one of the minor prophets to present a few lessons from to study together so that we can get a better understanding of that prophet's message and to bring that message into relevancy for 21st century Americans. So this year... I've chosen the prophet Amos. Three sermons from Amos. These will not be consecutive sermons. But we're going to have three lessons, three studies from the prophet Amos. So if you have not yet found Amos in your copy of God's Word, take a moment to do that. In Amos chapter 1 and verse 1, Amos tells us that he preached when King Uzziah was the king over Judah... And when King Jeroboam II was king over Israel. Now it's important for us to understand what was going on during his time in order to understand his message. So he preached about 750 years before Jesus came to earth. The story of King Uzziah is found in 1 Kings chapter 15 verses 1 through 7. The historian tells us that Uzziah was basically a good king. He became king when he was 16 years old, and he reigned for 55 years. I said that he was basically a good king because he did not do everything that he should have done as a godly king. 
He still uh, let there exist places around Jerusalem on the hills where people worship God, where they were not supposed to worship, and they may be even worshipped idols in those places. And then the historian tells us that God struck King Uzziah with leprosy. But the historian of 1 Kings doesn't tell us why. For that information, we have to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 26. I had a sermon on King Uzziah from 2 Chronicles chapter 26 about two years ago. Do you remember that sermon? 2 Corinthians chapter 26, the historian tells us that King Uzziah, his reign was going so well that he decided, based on his pride, that he did not have to do everything that God commanded him to do. And so King Uzziah decided one day that he wanted to go into the temple and he wanted to burn incense in the temple, which he can't do. King Uzziah is from the family of Judah, and only priests from the family of Levi could burn incense in the temple. And so King Uzziah is trying to do something that God has not given him permission to do. There is a priest by the name of Azariah with 80 other priests who come to King Uzziah to try to stop him from sinning against God. And King Uzziah gets mad at the priests. And it's at that, that moment that God strikes him with leprosy. And King Uzziah has leprosy until the day he dies. We do not know how long he had to live with leprosy and we do not know if he ever repented of his pride. The text never tells us. The other king who ruled during the days of Amos the preacher, the prophet, is King Jeroboam II. And his story is also told in 1 Kings, this time chapter 14, verses 23 through 27. King Jeroboam II also reigned for a very long time. He reigned for 41 years, but he was an evil king. He walked in the ways of his ancestor, King Jeroboam I, who in fact was instrumental in splitting the nation of Israel. And King Jeroboam II followed in his example of sinfulness against God. There were some things that King Jeroboam II did. That was, he strengthened their defenses. The historian also tells us in verse 25 of that text that the prophet Jonah preached during King Jeroboam II's reign, which means Amos and Jonah were contemporaries. So that gives us some background into the times when Amos was living. But what about the person Amos himself? What do we know about Amos himself? If you look back at chapter 1 and verse 1, Amos tells us that he was a shepherd from the village of Tekoa. Tekoa was a little small village about 10 miles south of Jerusalem. In other words, Amos was not a full-time preacher. He was a shepherd from a podunk town that was easy to ignore. Basically, he was a nobody. But God called him to be a preacher. In Amos chapter 7, beginning at verse 10, Amos says that there was a priest who came from the city of Bethel, and Bethel was a hotbed of paganism among God's people at that time. So this priest comes down to Samaria, and he tries to talk the king into exiling Amos out of the land. Get rid of that preacher. And basically, Amos tells that priest, he says, Look, I was not a preacher. I was home minding my own business, taking care of my sheep and collecting sycamore fruit so I could put food on the table for my family, but God gave me a message and I've got to preach it. So that is Amos. He was a little bit of a reluctant preacher, but when God speaks, man has to hear and he has to obey. So Amos goes to his fellow man, he goes to his fellow Israelite, and he preaches to him God's word. And what does Amos tell them? I want to look at Amos' message for his people, and if we understand in principle the message that Amos gave his people, then we understand the message that Amos would give us today if he were standing in our pulpit. First of all, Amos pictures God as a lion roaring his judgment against the nations of the world. Family, God is a universal God. He judges everybody by the same standard. 
First of all, I want you to notice in chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, that Amos rebukes the city of Damascus, which was the capital of Syria. Your translation might have Aram because of their violent behavior towards Gilead of Israel. I want you to just look at verse 3. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke its punishment because they threshed Gilead with implements of sharp iron. Violence. To bring this into New Testament times to make a mess, give a message for us as Christians, God calls us to be kind towards others. One aspect of the fruit of the Spirit is kindness, Galatians 5 and verse 22. Kindness is love in action. Kindness is treating other people the way I want them to treat me. When I'm talking with someone who rubs me the wrong way, my default reaction, my gut reaction is sarcasm. Now, sarcasm is not always wrong. The prophets of God use sarcasm sometimes. Even some New Testament writers like the Apostle Paul uses sarcasm. But I don't think that's God's desire for it to be our default re reaction, our gut reaction. No, God calls on us to be kind. Think about Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, where Paul tells Christians, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Now certainly that applies to our relationships with our enemies as well as with our friends and family. Secondly, Amos rebukes the nation of Philistia. Verses 6 through 8. Let's read verse 6 together. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Philistia, of Gaza, and for four, I will not revoke its punishment because they deported an entire population to deliver it up to Edom. In other words, Philistia had no respect for people's homes, their culture, their way of life. I had a sermon just a few weeks ago on racism. I'm not going to re-preach that sermon again this morning, of course. But my point in that lesson and the point here is that we need to respect other people's cultures. We need to respect other people's rituals, other people's traditions. The only traditions, the other, only cultural practices that are wrong are those that are sinful. When we were living in Romania and we had visitors from the United States come over and visit us, I told our Amer American visitors, I said, you're going to see Romanians do things that, sound, that look strange. And you're going to wonder, why on earth are they doing that? That's just dumb. And I felt the same way. Until I realized this point. Americans have more money than we have time. Romanians have more time than they have money. And so Romanians would make decisions in order to save money even though they would waste time. Whereas we as Americans, we would rather waste money and save our time because we have more money in that regard. So we need to be careful criticizing other people's cultures and other people's traditions and rituals when we don't always understand why they do what they do. Number three... Amos rebukes the city of Tyre, verses 9 and 10. Let's read verse 9. Thus does the Lord for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not revoke its punishment because they delivered up an entire population to Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. Edom was descendants of Esau. Israel was descendants of Jacob. And Jacob and Esau were brothers. Jacob and Esau made a covenant with each other. Their descendants had ignored it. In other words, Tyre was following the example of Philistia uh, rather than having respect for other people. God warned Israel under the law of Moses, do not follow a multitude to do evil. Exodus chapter 23 and verse 2. Family, you and I need to be very careful 
that we don't get caught up in the hype that we see on the news, on TV, and we do things just because everybody else does them. You and I, as individuals and as a congregation, need to make sure that the, what governs our behavior is the Word of God. What motivates us to decide what is right and what is wrong is the Word of God, what the Bible says. We cannot allow other people to influence us for evil companionship to corrupt good morals. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33. Number four, Amos rebukes Edom itself in verses 11 and 12. Let's read verse 11. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four I will not revoke its punishment because he pursued his brother with the sword while he stifled his, com his compassion. His anger also tore continually and he maintained his fury forever. Amos rebukes Edom. Notice that just because Edom was the recipient of bad behavior from Philistia and Tyre did not mean that God is going to ignore Edom's sins. We might be a faithful congregation of God's people as a whole, but that's not going to mean that every single individual member of the Swartz Creek congregation is going to heaven. The faithfulness of the congregation will help you go to heaven. But you are going to be judged individually. And I am going to be judged individually. And that's why it's so important that we have our own dedication to Jesus Christ, our own faith and trust in Christ, and our own obedient life walking with Christ. That's why it's so important for each of us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. Number 5. Amos rebukes Ammon. Verses 13 through 15. Look at verse 13. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the sons of Ammon and for four, I will not revoke its punishment because they ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to enlarge their borders. Now ripping open a pregnant woman, which was practiced quite often during World War II by Hitler's Germany, is a sin that is so repugnant and so cruel it deserves its own special punishment. But I want you to observe why they did it. Amos says they did it in order to enlarge the borders of their nation. Family covetousness. Covetousness is that consuming desire to have more and more and more. Covetousness is greed put into action. If kindness is love put into action, then covetousness is greed, it's selfishness put into action. And the Bible uses the word covetousness and condemns covetousness at least 11 times. I direct your attention to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 5. Where the Apostle Paul writes to Christians, No immoral or impure person or covetous, which is idolatry, shall inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. And so you and I need to examine our hearts, be honest with ourselves, that we are not entering into morally gray areas just because we want to have more money or we want to have more stuff or we want to have a larger bank account. Covetousness is sinful. Number six, as we move into chapter two, we see where Amos rebukes the nation of Moab. I want us to look at verse 1. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab and for four I will not revoke its punishment because he burned the bones of the king of Edom to lie. Moab mistreated Edom, just like Philistia and Tyre did. But it particularly Amos rebukes their leadership. Look at verse 3. I will also cut off the judge from their midst and slay all her princes with him, says the Lord. You've heard the expression probably that the bottleneck is at the top. 
an organization is only as good or as inept as its leadership. Here I'm talking to elders and deacons and ministers, Bible class teachers. We are all teachers and we all influence others as they look to us for leadership. And we need to be very careful that Jesus Christ is our standard, that He is our God, that He's our motivation, that He is our inspiration. The Apostle Paul warned Timothy, a young preacher, to be careful of his influence as a leader. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 16, Paul says, Pay attention to yourself and to your doctrine, for in doing so you will save both yourself and all of those who hear you. Number seven, Amos rebukes Judah, his own people, for not respecting the laws of God. Look at verse four. Thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not revoke its punishment because they rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his statutes. Family, we cannot overemphasize how important it is to obey Christ's commands. Obey, obey, obey. And because it is so important for us to obey the commandments of Christ, you and I need to be careful about the influences that are in our lives. Either influences to obey the commands of Christ or discouragement from obeying the commands of Christ. The Hebrew writer tells us that Jesus is the author of those who obey Him, the author of eternal salvation to those who obey Him. Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9. And of course, Jesus clearly says in John 14 and verse 15 that we show our love for Jesus Christ when we obey Him. And so, finally, in number 8, Amos rebukes his neighbors, the nation of Israel. These are the northern tribes that are known as Israel. Notice in verse 6, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke its punishment because they sell the righteous for money and the needy for a pair of sandals. The nation of Israel was not respecting the poor. These people were taking advantage in every conceivable way of those who were less off in their society. They would twist the laws if they were able to in order to get the upper hand against the righteous and against the poor. You and I need to be thoughtful of those who are less off than we are, of those who are poor. The Apostle Paul writes that God has given us jobs performing the work with our own hands so that we may have to give to those who are in need. Ephesians 4 and verse 28. My life is not about me. It's about Jesus Christ. My budget is not about me. It's about Jesus Christ. Now once Amos gets these rebukes out of the way, then he moves on and he shares with Israel some blessings that God has given them. We will not take the time to read verses 9 through 11, but I want to point out in these verses, notice what God says that He's done for Israel. Cody led us in that song, Count Your Many Blessings. God reminds Israel, here are some of the blessings that I gave you. Number one, I destroyed the Amorite, the people who were dwelling in the land so that Israel could move into the land so that they could get prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ. Secondly, God says, I brought you out of slavery in Egypt. Number three, I led you through the wilderness for 40 years and I gave you meat to eat and, and bread from heaven and water out of rocks. Tonight we're going to take some time at the 5 o'clock service to study one of those examples where God gave them meat to eat. Numbers chapter 11. God brought Israel out of slavery and God gave them preachers, prophets, to teach them the word of God to share with them the message from God. And God gave them Nazarites. Nazarites were Israelites who made a special commitment, a special vow to serve God. And that vow wasn't given, wasn't taken rather, in order to shame other Israelites, but rather it was taken in order to encourage other Israelites to raise their level of dedication to God. 
So those are just some of the blessings that God gave the nation of Israel. The problem was, it did not motivate them to be thankful and to obey. And so verses 12 through 16, Amos tells Israel, ingratitude is going to be punished. How did the Israelites treat those Nazarites? They made them drink wine. If you don't remember, back in Numbers chapter 6, the law of Moses said that if an individual wants to take the special vow of a Nazarite, then he's not to, supposed to drink or eat anything that came from the grape. He could not drink strong, uh, strong drink and not drink uh, vinegar. He could not eat grapes. He could not eat raisins that came from the grape. But in Amos' day, the Israelites somehow were enticing the Nazarites to drink wine, to break their vow to God. The Israelites in Amos' day also was trying to get the prophets to stop preaching the word of God. Amos was stepping on too many toes and they wanted him to shut up. God says he's not going to let punishment like that or, or a behavior like that go unpunished. Verse 13, he's going to weigh them down. They're not going to be able to flee or fight their way out of God's judgment. Verse 14, the bow, the runner, the horse is not going to save them. Verse 15, that's reference to their military. And then God says that the brave are not going to be able to escape God's judgment either in verse 16. If you and I are really honestly thankful to God for what he's given to us, for his material blessings and for his spiritual blessings, it's going to show in our behavior. It's going to reflect in our behavior. We're, want, we're going to want to come to worship God and tell God thank you. We're going to want to work together with God to make his kingdom as large as possible. We're going to work through the church in order for the church to be as large as possible because it represents souls that are saved. And in that way, we bring honor to God and glory to Jesus Christ. The last message that we want to look at is in chapter 3. With great power comes great responsibility. For those of you who are cultured, you know that comes from Marvel Comics. It's a story of Spider-Man. But I think that statement is also a biblical principle. With great honor comes great responsibility. First of all, notice what Amos says in chapter 3 and verse 1. Hear this word which the Lord has spoken against you, sons of Israel, against the entire family which he brought up from the land of Egypt. So God chose Israel above all the families of the earth to be the nation through whom Jesus would come to the earth. And that made them special. But Israel chose not to appreciate that unique calling and so Israel sinned against God, verse 2. And God says, I've got to punish you. Because in verse 3, God says, I can't walk with you unless we are in agreement. Look at verse 3. Do two men walk together unless they have an appointment, an agreement? In verse 4, Amos says, a lion roars after it catches its prey. In verse 5, a bird falls into the trap after it grabs the bait. In verse 6, a trap springs after it catches its prey. A people tremble after they hear the trumpet sound for war. A calamity happens to a city after God causes it. What's the point of those three verses? The point is, family, that there is a cause and effect relationship between sin and judgment. If you sin, it brings judgment. But this is not done unexpectedly. And it's not done in secret. God has told us exactly what he expects out of us. Look at what Amos says in verse 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. Family, we're not going to be surprised on the day of judgment. In whatever way we're going to be judged on a day of judgment, God has told us right here what He expects. 
because He's revealed His will through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so because Israel was not being obedient to Jehovah God, then God is going to send the Assyrian nation. Within three decades, He's going to send the Assyrian nation. That's what Amos predicts in verse 12. And Israel is going to be punished. The rest of chapter 3 emphasizes that God is bringing punishment on His own children because they refuse to change their behavior and listen to His Word. As Christians, you and I know that with great power comes great responsibility. We know the Word of God. If we don't, we're obligated to learn the Word of God. And then we have the responsibility to, to live the Word of God and to teach the Word of God. And just because we're a Christian doesn't mean we have our ticket punched into heaven. We still have to live a faithful, dedicated life to Jesus Christ for the rest of our lives. Amos lived over 700 years before Jesus walked the earth. But Amos' message is just as relevant for you and me today. We can't walk together with God unless we agree in word and in action with what God has to say. And so let each of us this morning examine our hearts and our lives and ask ourselves, is my life measuring up to the expectations of Jesus Christ and His Word? If it doesn't, Christ went to the cross to pay the penalty for that disobedience. But we have to obey Him if we want to be saved. Jesus said in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. It's just that simple. If we can help you put Christ on in baptism this morning, let us know. Or if you look at your life this morning and say, you know what, I know I'm not living up to Christ's expectations. I need help. I need encouragement. We'll be more than happy to pray for you and to encourage you in your walk with Christ so that you can be in agreement with God and you can be saved. Let us know if we can help you this morning. Let's stand and sing together.